it's my great pleasure to welcome to the podcast today, Mr. Vinit Naya, the chairman of the Sam Park Foundation and the former CEO of HCL Technologies and author of the book, Employees First, Customers Second. Uh, I'm speaking with Vinit today because he will be presenting a keynote presentation at the HR Congress this November in Brussels. And I just want to welcome Vinit to the podcast and uh, let's get everything underway. Thank you, Ben. Good to be here. So the first question I have for you is, is on the topic of leadership, which is something obviously you've written and spoken about uh, and have a lot of experience with. And there are some common characteristics that you tend to bring up in your presentations and, and writings on leadership. Some of these characteristics could be humility, reflection, and honesty. Why do you think these characteristics are so important for leaders to possess? So what happened, Ben, was that uh, when the industrial age came in, the word manager was born. The ability to manage resources, the ability to manage people, the ability to be able to collectively produce 10x compared to what an individual could produce. And therefore, the whole management ethos during the industrial age was all about managing performance appraisals, uh, monitoring, measurement, and all that stuff. Uh, over the last one, one and a half decade, the industrial age has given up to what I call the innovation age, where ideas and human capital, the way they think about those ideas, dominate the creation of value of the organization and for the individual. Now, when we are moving away from industrial age to an innovation age, you can't manage, you need to lead. And the trait which is different for a leader compared to a manager is this whole concept of the fact that you need to lead by inspiring not by counting, but by creating value. You have to be focused on getting the best out of people. And the only way you can get the best out of people is for them to want to work for you. And if they have to want to work for you, then honesty, integrity, humility, you know, all those aspects of leadership become very critical. So in my mind, what people are missing out today is they are still managing as if they are in the industrial age, and forgetting how to lead, so they are no more leaders, and then wondering why their organization doesn't have enough innovation, and why their people are not inspired to, to come up with creative ideas to create multiple fold value. Indeed, I think you've just preempted my next question, or maybe that was by design. And I, I was going to ask you, why do you think that there's this paradox between obviously managing and leadership and why people tend to stick with the managerial aspects. So I guess the, the ghost of the industrial revolution is still haunting us in this respect. So why do you think people tend to stick with the status quo? Yeah, I, I think the reason is a lot of uh, managers today who grew up in the industrial age have not figured out that the world has changed. That's reason number one. Reason number two is managing is easier than leading because leading is much tougher. Therefore, they end up managing because that's easier to do. Number three is managing to some leaders or to some managers is more fulfilling because they believe they have a right on people. They believe barking orders on people or dominating people or commanding people or being military dictators and rulers on people gives them a satisfaction of life gives them a control, which is, which is really not true. Mm. Uh, and they have not figured out that actually that's not the way to manage. That's not the best way, best way of getting best out of people. So they are still in the dark. So I, I, I truly believe that as we educate people, as there are more and more examples of people like Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, who, who have led revolutions by not managing the leading not being in a position of command and control, but leading through ideas, leading by inspiring people to, to try and do stuff they had never done before. As more and more people learn from them and learn from other people who are very innovative, Steve Jobs and many other people who created innovative organizations, to be successful, I think they will change their management style from managing to leading. When speaking of the, the transformation process at HCL, uh, you said, and I'm, I'm quoting you here, I knew that as leaders, we have done nothing to win the trust of our employees, and that was pre-transformation. Can you elaborate a little bit more, perhaps, on how to, to win trust? So what, what really happens is that we, we have to understand that the power of intention uh, of a CEO uh, is known to every single employee 
even if the CEO doesn't speak a word. So if your intention uh, is not good uh, for the collective good of the organization, then the employees will not trust you. And therefore, just by giving town hall meetings in very slick presentation, in video form, or you are an orator of tremendous skills, people will not trust you because they can see through that. The implication of not trusting is you may have the world's best idea, but people will not execute it. Because they don't trust that what you're saying is good for them, collective good for them, not individually good for them. And therefore, they will say yes in front of you, but when, they, when you turn your back, they will not execute on it. So even great ideas falter on execution because the employees don't trust you. So if, you're, if the answer to the question is that I need employees to execute my brilliant ideas, if you are the author of the brilliant ideas, then there is no way they will execute it unless you win their trust. And the only way to win their trust is by com be completely transparent, not only on what you intend to do, which is intention, but how you plan to execute and the impact it would ha have on them. Once you win their trust, oh my God, they will rally behind your idea and make a 10 idea into a 100 idea. One of the real frustrating thing for me as I watch organization after organization is they most of the organizations are scared of employees instead of seeing them as an opportunity of converting every average idea into a superb idea and that is the reason most organizations of today are what I call one trick pony they have one innovative idea and based on that one innovative idea they become a great company and after that, we don't see any additional innovation from them. It's because they are unable to create a culture of innovation through creating a culture of trust and constantly making average ideas into super ideas. So I don't want to name specific companies where, where employees are losing trust. But if you see the Gallup polls, which recently were released, you would see that a very large percentage, depending on country, 60 to 80% of the employees are hugely frustrated with their organization and work environment, and they don't trust their boards. They don't trust their CEOs. And in that, if that data is correct, then what a great loss opportunity in front of us, and why can't the CEOs see it and fix it? Indeed. And it brings me back to a, another point I wanted to make about transparency. So for me, of course, there are two very important T's in, in this conversation, trust and transparency. On, on the topic of transparency, we've seen many organizations give uh, a certain glib uh, level of surface to becoming more transparent in quotation marks. What do you see as the role of transparency? Uh, and how could an organization take the steps to be more transparent? So I, I, I would say that I came to this conclusion that the trust and transparency linked through my own experience at HCL. So at HCL, you know, we were a $750 million company, losing mind share, market share, talent share. Uh, we wanted to grow bigger, bolder, but we were not growing as fast as our competition. We had some ideas on how we could potentially transform, change the form of HCL. But when I looked at the employees, I came to the same conclusion as you asked me. The previous question is, they don't trust me. So if they don't trust me, they will not trust my ideas. They will not trust my vision. They will not trust what I want to do. They will not trust me in anything. Now, the question I had is, how do I break that do loop of the fact you don't trust me, therefore you will not execute on the ideas? How do I break it? So what I did was I said, okay, let me throw all the dirty linen in public. Let me, let me accept everything which is broken with this company. Let me put all the dirty data out in the public. Let the financial data of the divisions which are not performing, of people who are not performing, of strategies which are not performing, of things which ELR company. Let's put all of that into public domain, which is the internal intranet public domain. And every time in an open house, an employee will ask me, we need, you know, we are not good at this, and I would say yes. We are not good at that, I would say yes. So, so the moment in honesty and transparency started coming in, People, A, got shocked. How can we need to put that data out in the public? Because, you know, all our life, we are convincing our employees on how great 
the company we are in. And it reminds me of a story which is very interesting for me to tell you here that a plumber walked into a rich man's house and uh, the rich man spent one hour telling him about how great the house was and Michelangelo painted a painting there and Mahatma Gandhi had sat on one corner and Martin Luther King had sat on another corner. And he was very enamored by his own house and spent an hour talking about how a great historical house the plumber has walked into. And after, a, after an hour, the plumber asked him, that's very great, Mr. Smith, but where the hell is the leak? Now, if you imagine the employee walking into the organization, we like that, Mr. Smith, keep on telling him how great and how privileged the employees are walking into the organization. And we don't tell him where the leak is, but we expect the employee to work very hard to fix the leak, which we don't tell him where the leak is. Now, that's transparency. If the day one day an employee comes in and we say, here is a leak, here is a leak, here is a leak, here is a leak. And the reason we hired you is to fix the leaks. And we know you're the only one who can fix the leak. Imagine what an employee would do. And that is the power of transparency. Not only it creates trust, but it creates a need for action, which, which you have not seen before. Regarding the DHL transformation, how was HR specifically and some of the business leaders uh, involved in the, the execution or the rollout of the transformation project? So the HL transformation story, I think, is a, is a unique story because uh, we transformed 100,000 employees. Uh, HL is an IT services firm. Uh, as I told you, we were $750 million. We grow sixfold uh, in revenues, market cap, and profitability. And you know, we grew to be 100,000 employees. The entire execution of HL transformation was executed, was thought through, and executed by the employee. Let me start with the idea first and then answer your question on execution. The idea was very simple. The idea was that the core, core question we ask ourselves is what is the core business we are in? And we came to a conclusion that the business we are in is to create unique differentiated value for our customers, unique experiences for our customers. Then we asked the second question, who creates the unique differentiated value? And our answer was our employees create the unique differentiated experiences or value for our customers. And hence the third question, if our employees are the unique differentiation or are creating unique experiences, then what should the role of manager and management be? And that is the day the idea, the fact that the role of manager and management can be nothing but employees first, customer second, which is infusing, encouraging, enabling those employees to create the value so that the company can grow faster. That's how the concept of employees first, customer second was born. But once the idea was born, what we did was I took it to my 100 leaders and said, hey guys, if we want to transform HCL, we, can, we have two choices. We can transform HCL on the what axis in terms of what we do, product, proposition, pricing, uh, markets, or actually we can culturally transform HCL, which is on the how axis of how we as an organization are running. And Trans and energize the organization, increase the energy level and capacity level of the organization, and grow with the same product, the same service, the same market, and the same proposition, the same price. So these are the two choices we have. So we debated and discussed that quite extensively and came to a conclusion that the employee first cultural transformation is an idea worth trying. Once that decision was done, then we threw that idea to our employees and slowly developed initiatives of how we can invert the pyramid. For example, my appraisal was done by one lakh employees confidentially and the results were published on the web to all, all to see. And that was done for 6,000 of my colleague managers. So all of those initiatives were ideas which originated from HR, from other leaders, from employees. None of them were my, my ideas. And all those ideas were taken together, were built together, were executed together, and some of them succeeded and a lot of them failed. But the sum which succeeded transformed the culture of HCL from leader first to an employee first. And that resulted into a six-fold growth in revenue, becoming number one in employee satisfaction, number one in customer satisfaction, and the world suddenly started recognizing HCL as a thought leader, as an unconventional company, we suddenly started winning a lot of contracts. Suddenly the customers started seeing a unique experience which they had never seen before. All that started happening. So it was, 
I would create, I would say internal crowdsourcing of ideas, internal crowdsourcing of execution. Everybody started thinking of collective good and a culture of transparency and accountability of the management to the employee and the magic happened. It sounds like a communal exercise and unlocking or unleashing energy, if, if that makes any sense. I actually, Ben, what, a, what an interesting point when you think about the fact that you spend your own money, your own gas, your own time on a Sunday to go to a church or mosque or a mandir and feel good about it. And then on Monday, you get paid to go to office and you feel bad about it. There is something wrong with our organization that our organizations are not giving our employees what they are seeking. If we were to change that, and the fact that we are paying the employees, that's an additional fact. I think we can unlock a magical energy force in our organizations, which we have not seen before. And that is exactly what happened in Insia. I get the impression that the, the boundaries have been removed from the imaginations of employees, which of course is fantastic because as we know, there are plenty of people who have commented that you shouldn't hire people and then tell them what to do. You should hire people who are capable of telling you what to do and then obviously lead the company forward. And I, I think it's, it makes total logical sense for employees to, to come first because after all, they are, the, they are the ones that fuel everything in the organization. So for example, when you're hiring for the, the transformed version of HCL, you've got this new, this new motto, this new mantra, this new idea. What are the types of things you're looking for in, in potential employees and potential hires? Uh, and how does HR go about sourcing people for the organization who are going to not only buy into this, this idea, but really positively contribute? So a comment about HR before I, I, I go and answer that question. The only community which has been trained to think about the ideas I'm talking about is the HR community. If you take a normal MBA student, he would understand products, pricing, market, strategy, uh, how to beat competition. The HR folks have been trained to think about a mind of a human being. And they have been trained to figure out the best way of getting the most out of the human being. So the reason employee first, customer second, management mantra, or the reason helping the organization move from being manager oriented or managing oriented to leading and inspiring oriented is the role of an HR, which I think HR can fulfill and nobody else can. Now, the way to think about is where is the value zone of the company? The value zone of the company is where tremendous value gets created, the maximum value gets created, which largely in most organizations is either in the R&D cell, if it is a discovery-oriented company, or it is in the interface of the employee and the customer in that interface where you are creating, delivering the services created in your R&D or creating it in your manufacturing plant, and you're delivering that to the customer. The value zone in the industrial age used to be in the manufacturing plant. And therefore, all our leadership books and you know, principles of leadership and how can you become better are all manager-oriented, which is factory port related, of how do you handle industrial workers. The value zone has shifted now when people are bringing not industrialized products, but customized products, creating unique experiences for the customer. The value zone has shifted to the interface of the employee and the customer. If there is where the maximum value is being created, and I call that the value zone, then the entire organization has to be inverted. The pyramid has to be inverted so that the organization reports to the value zone. So that everybody in the organization works to enable the employee in the value zone to deliver the best kind of experience or value for its customer. Now that's not very difficult to understand. Therefore, the, there is no role for the pyramid organization, which was always moving up, which was true with our manufacturing days. In the value zone days, you have to invert the pyramid, and therefore the CEO has to be accountable to the employee who's creating and delivering the unique services to the customer. If you don't do that, then you are not unlocking the potential in today's, today's world. You travel into an airline, it is the same Boeing 380, you travel on Emirates, and you travel on United or American or some other airline, 
And there's a tremendous difference in, in the services you get and the experience you get is because of the employee creating the value in that value zone in a multi-million dollar plane. But the one employee who hardly gets any money is making all the difference. And once you realize that's where the value zone is and that's where the value is creating, you need to invert the entire organization pyramid to deliver magic in that zone. It almost reminds me of a direct democracy model. So it's a fascinating way to think about it. And I think a lot of organizations have begun to give some service to, to this idea. But, you know, the legacy of all of those old industrial ages and the big organizations out there, it's, it's going to be hard to break down for a lot of people. Well, only I, through this podcast, I want to, because I do know that HR community is listening to this podcast. I do want to tell the HR community that why don't you see your role different to your organization's role? You are been absolutely you're right that some of the organizations which are so rooted in legacy, they will not change. But there was a time when the CFOs became CEOs. There was a time when sales guys became CEOs. And you know, those were the days, and today is a day where innovation and human capital is critical to organizations' success. Why would CHROs not become CEOs? And the CHROs will become CEOs if they tell the organization, if they teach the organization that you are thinking in the wrong way if you're rooted in your legacy. So start democratizing the organization. Exactly, look at what is happening to your house. Can you command and control your teenagers in your house? If you can't, then how can you do that with your employees? How difficult is that to understand? So I believe that HR community has a very critical role in today's time to convince boards to change their way and for some of the CHROs to become CEOs to demonstrate that by doing this, you can unlock potential of the kind the world has not seen before. So I just like to, to draw things back a little bit. You know, obviously, the HR Congress is going to be coming up in, in November. So I just like to ask you if you could provide us and our listeners with just a few quick insights into what you'll be speaking about. Obviously, we've kind of covered a lot of the topics already. So in the HR conference, I'm going to try and transform. Transform is change the form of something permanently. How can an HR community participate in transforming, changing the form completely of their organization from a managing oriented uh, organization into an inspiring and leading oriented organization? I'm going to walk through ways you can do it. I can walk through my experiences. I, can, I will walk through what, what worked for me, and I will walk through a lot of failures, what didn't work for me. And hopefully, it will trigger an, a bell in, in people's mind. And hopefully, it will create an idea of, like that plumber, the HR community trying to find out where the leak is in their organization and going to transform their own organizations. Fantastic. And I'd just like to, to finish off with perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about the, the Sam Park Foundation and, of course, maybe some ways people could connect or, or donate or help out the foundation. So in India, we have 144 million children studying in government schools. The, there are different kind of reports which have come out on, on the learning level of these children, but there is a consensus on the fact that 80% of these children in grade five cannot recognize numbers beyond 99, cannot add and subtract, and cannot construct simple sentences in their local languages. So while you have seen India as a country of demographic dividend with a lot of young people, I think we are facing a size and scale of a challenge we have never seen before. And unless we fix the education system in the government education system for these 144 million children, I think we have a disaster waiting to happen where we will have a very large number of young, unemployable and unemployed, uneducated youth. And that's not what I want to see in India. So therefore, I quit being the vice chairman and CEO of HCL when I turned 50. And me and my wife decided that we will do everything in our power to try and innovate, try and inspire, try and invest in transforming learning outcomes for these 144 million children. So we focused on three innovations. We said if we can ignite the classroom 
through Bollywood, as you know, India is known for Bollywood. If we can bring the same Bollywood excitement in the class, can we energize the class and excite the teacher and the student to learn more? So that was our first innovation. Number two, can we ignite and inspire the teacher to do more than what she is doing because she believes in the cause and we suddenly make her a hero because everybody was beating down on her. Can we make her a hero? And number three, can we partner with the government and inspire and change the government's outlook to try and bring about the change in partnership with us because we can't do it alone. So we created, because there is hardly any electricity in Indian villages, we created an audio device. In the audio device, we put in a lot of Bollywood actresses, uh, which we call Sampark Didi, voices, dance, songs, all that stuff. And we use that audio device to teach English and maths to our children. Today, we train 2 lakh teachers, 200,000 teachers in 76,000 schools, impacting learning outcomes of 7 million children across six states of, of India. Remember, I talked to you about the 144 million children learning average in grade five was they could not recognize number beyond 99, could not construct simple sentences in their own language. The learning outcome assessment by independent studies of the Sampak Smart Shala, which is our program, across 7 million children was that in grade two, they can do three-digit division and three-digit multiplication, and they can construct English sentences of a language they had not spoken a year ago. So the transformation and innovation which is happening on the ground in collaboration with the government is one of the largest education transformation I think the world has seen. How you can participate, I don't know. But how you can participate, the easiest one is to come and come with resources and donate to the cause so that we can go to more and more uh, institutions. Today, me and my wife are investing in all this on our own. So we would love to have partners who can donate and help us not reach 7 million, but help us reach 144 million. Number two is you could help volunteer and come work for us and create content which could transform learning outcomes in these schools. You could volunteer at, in an immersion program of working in villages to transform these schools. There are many ways you can help change the future of India by participating in transforming the learning outcome of these 144 million children. I leave that to you of how you want to do it, but I can tell you we can do with some help. Fantastic. It sounds like an amazing initiative, and I, I really do sincerely wish all the, all the best for you in that. So, yeah, we'll, we'll make sure that uh, there are some appropriate links and some uh, ways people can follow up. So that brings us to the conclusion of the podcast today. You'll be joining us at BHR Congress. You'll get to meet Vinet there, and I'm sure he'd be happy to talk with you in detail. Thanks a lot for doing this, Ben, and I'm excited about being there in November, uh, shaking hands, learning more, and sharing our experiences. Looking forward to it.